You are listening to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. Season ticket holders and lifelong fans with neighborhood ties discuss Cubs news and neighborhood happenings. Here's your hosts, Jeremy and Pat. Hello and welcome to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. This is episode 320 of the podcast. My name is Jeremy Deemer and I'll be your host. Joined as always by my co-host, he's my cousin, and he's high atop Wrigleyville tonight. How's it going, Pat? It's going all right, Jeremy. Just watching all the home runs fly out of Wrigley Field in the home run derby. Oh, wait. Sorry. They won't let the Cubs have the all-star game here in Chicago, <laughs> at least not in the last you know, 30, uh, three years. No, they, they, they most definitely will not. We will talk about the all-star game as uh, we are podcasting. This week, we'll, we're, we're going to recap last week and what an important week it is for this season. We're going to take a week off. We won't be here next week because we'll take our all-star break uh, next week. So, uh, yeah, Home Run Derby happening as we record this week's podcast. And to help us break down all the Cubs news, all the Cubs happenings as we hit the, uh, the, the home stretch to the trade deadline, it is a longtime friend of the show. You know him from every podcast at NBC Sports and uh, Much. <laughs> and all of his fine work on, on the digital platforms for, for NBC Chicago. James Naveau, thanks for taking time out to come back on and talk Cubs with us tonight. See, I thought it was going to be Big Ten football since that's the new uh, gig over here at NBC. But I suppose I can uh, talk some Cubs considering I do do that on an occasional basis as well. <laughs> Yeah, and you've been jet setting. I've been seeing you out and about at uh, ballparks yes. all around the country, uh, catching, right. catching baseball action. Yeah, I, uh, in May I went to Target Field for the first time. I went to Petco and Angel Stadium in June. Got to see a Savannah Bananas game. Threw in a uh, Springfield uh, Lucky Horseshoes game for good measure, and then just went to. Uh, American Family Field for uh, the roof-based fiasco on July 4th. So, yeah, I've been uh, making my way around town. I uh, almost have as many frequent flyer miles as you two guys have. <laughs> well, yeah, you got to see uh, you got to see a lot of uh, Cubs on the road. I was able. Uh, I did lift. A, a, I, I borrowed and credited a couple of your photos from these games uh, on the Wrigleyville Nation site. So, uh, uh, from from your your travels here, so very very cool stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And a quick review of those ballparks you just mentioned. Which one should people go out of their way to see a game at? Uh, a thousand percent. Like I I basically have Petco Park and PNC Park as one and one A. I absolutely adored Petco Park when I went there for the World Baseball Classic in 2017. Uh, made my return there this season for the Cubs and just all the fans there are great. Food options are fantastic. I have a few little quibbles with the way traffic flows around inside the stadium, but everything there is just so top notch and so pretty. And of course, San Diego is a really fun city as well. Target field. I had heard kind of mixed reviews really liked it. Actually. I have that, I believe number six among the ballparks that I've been to. And then angel stadium was, it was a baseball stadium. It wasn't awful, but just nothing, nothing to write home about. I honestly have never been to a park. That's like a total dump. So (laughs) I'm not going to, you know, try to sit here and say, Angel Stadium is awful or anything like that. It's just, it's very, very much a product of the era it was built in, in the middle of like a parking lot with very little around it. So it, it it's like a metaphor a for the points. team, really, when you think about it. I mean, I did get to see Shohei Otani hit a home run, which is yeah. always what I will treasure his, about that. His but... final Los Angeles season. <laughs> Los Angeles Angels. Angels. Let's put an asterisk there. I was yeah. going to say, <laughs> I, I've been beating the Otani to the Dodgers drum for like a year and a half now. So yeah. I am full, I'm still fully anticipating that happening. Although who knows, maybe the Ricketts will shell out $600 million. You never know. Well, those are the Ricketts that I know and love. They, they do. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, I do want to Re- make rename mention- them Chelsea football club. Maybe they'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to make mention about Petco park. If, you're in San Diego and you're bummed out that they're not in town and you can't catch a Padres game. Do what I did when I went there, and that's take a ballpark tour 
The ballpark mm. tour of Petco, also fantastic. You get to go into the clubhouses. You get to go onto the field, into the dugouts. You get to really see all the areas of Petco Park. So definitely uh, do the ballpark tour if they're not in town. If they're in town, check out a game, 100%. One of my favorite stadiums. Yeah. And with that, we'll talk about the Chicago Cubs in the week that was. We said going into last week, Pat, this was crucial, a crucial week. If the Cubs could go 5-2 and two last week, you would see them put pressure on the front office to say, we've still got a shot in a terrible division. We can still give this a go. If they did a 4-3 and three record, a little more iffy, convince me you're not going to be a – just a 500 team down the stretch, anything worse than that. And we were guaranteed to see a sell off. Uh, where are you Pat after last week's performance and, uh, a, a, a draw two and two with, uh, with the brewers and then taking two of three in surprising fashion in New York. Well, Cubs are in limbo, of course, as usual, uh, five and five in their last 10, Four and three on the week, so that's good. They, they came back and salvaged those last two against the Yankees against popular belief that they would not. Uh, and or I guess they, they get the first and the third. But um, they salvaged two out of three in general, uh, losing to Gary Cole. But I, I'd say that the, the thing with the Cubs, you know, that Brewer series was frustrating because he could have won all four games. could have lost all four. could have lost two, all four right? easily. Oh, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it felt like a week where the Cubs could have easily – uh, been six and one, or even like two and five, uh, maybe one and six if everything fell apart. And so, like much of the season, and we've complained about this, and I think this is part of why fans are so frustrated this year. The Cubs feel it feels like the Cubs have have given away or blown a lot of winnable games this year, and it also seems like this is not a team that can afford to do that because of some of the talent limitations. But I think it is those very talent limitations that have resulted in them blowing games that they otherwise seemingly should have won. And I think they're just playing more or less to, to where they're at in terms of their abilities. And we can quibble with, with Ross for sure. Uh, but if, but if 80% of your games are going to be close games and you're only going to win, you know, a third of them, uh, it's going to be easy to blame the manager because things aren't going to work right. Things are always going to, you're always going to be just a little bit short and there are times when it seemed obvious that he maybe really kind of, at least to us, you know, in, in our, in our, on our couches, you know, he really made some blunders, but other times it's like, well, what was he supposed to do? Who is he supposed to pitch? Who is he supposed to bat? You know I mean? He's got a flawed team, right? And because they're a flawed team, they're it's, it's, I think it's unrealistic to assume that they're going to stop making mistakes, uh, stop being bad when they should be good and and become a, a much better team but i think the instinct is to want to say we're so close to being a better team if we just could stop screwing up in key situations so often but i think that's part of the problem with the team that's that's who they are i think at this point i mean we've got 73 games to go in the season so we played over half of it and this is kind of who they are they're gonna they're going to win some games, uh, and they're going to get you excited, and then they're going to lose games that you're like, I can't believe we lost that game. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much uh, been the story of the entire Cubs season. They've always been a team that's going to have a razor-thin margin of error, and if anything goes wrong, then they're basically not going to win the game. And I thought that reared its ugly head again and again in Milwaukee, and they somehow managed to win that Tuesday game thanks to – Ian Happ making two of the best throws he's probably ever made in his life. (laughs) They had the comeback on Wednesday. They had another comeback yesterday. I mean, this team, I will give them credit for the fact that they do legitimately, they don't quit. Like they definitely play hard through the end of the games. I know they've blown quite a few in the late stages as well. So it's not always a results based thing, but you can tell the intensity level is there, I think. And that's been on full display this week. But yeah, I just, I look at the way that, 
this kind of unfolded this week with the four and three record didn't really gain any ground in the division. There's still seven games back in the central, which I, I feel like right now is it's still insurmountable based on the talent that the Cubs have. The fact you're probably going to get guys like Marcus Stroman who are going to come back down to earth a little bit. Although you may see the ascendancy of some guys like a Fisaya Suzuki or an Ian Happ gets hot. Maybe it counteracts that a little bit, but I just always, I've always thought that this team's kind of margin for error was way too thin to begin with. And then you throw in the injuries that they've had to like Dansby Swanson and now Nick Madrigal and the kind of flux that's thrown like third base and first base into. And the, all of these things kind of conspire to a team that even if for whatever reason, Jed Hoyer's like, we think we can still win the central division, even though we are seven games out at the all-star break, we still feel like this is winnable. What pieces are they going to try to add at the trade deadline that are actually going to make them a better team right now and that they're willing to part with the assets required to actually go get them, right? Like a lot of the guys who are kind of like the top tier of players who are available are starting pitching, and that's probably not where the Cubs are going to be focused. And I think that – do you really think a guy like Heimer Candelario is going to make – or break the Cubs season if they go out and acquire him? Probably not. If they try to go out and get like a Josh Hader from the San Diego Padres, is that going to do it? Probably not. I don't think that they're close enough to justify being buyers on big ticket items at the deadline. And as a result, I'm still leaning towards the camp that they need to not necessarily undergo a major sell-off. I think they have enough kind of like mid-range talent in their farm system that they don't have to sit there and try to like just recoup a whole bunch of assets. But if you can move a guy like a Marcus Stroman or a Cody Bellinger and get like a, a better prospect, just one better prospect even in that regard, I think that's something that you consider right now. But like I said, I don't think they need to go full on sale just to get a bunch of assets. But I think trying to like kind of hone in on certain key guys might end up being the way to go for them. Yeah, it's when you look at what the Cubs biggest needs are, they're like you mentioned, not available. Like starting pitching is actually not a need for this team right now. Uh, And you have uh, you have this gaping hole of first base and now who would have thought if Nick Madrigal got hurt you'd have concerns about third base and uh you you've got you've got no power on the corners right now for this team you've got no power in the middle of that lineup some of those games you're watching you're like man it would be great to have someone who could come up and hit a home run in one of these situations but you just don't have that feeling with this team in the middle of the lineup that they can they can have the power to to swing a game and there's just not a lot of those guys out there for the the trade deadline right now and jeremy i was talking to our friend dave the other day you remember dave and uh i made the comment he kind of chuckled at it at first but i guess when you think about it it's true the cubs have played the entire season without their best two hitters and he, at first, he's like, what do you mean about their best two hitters? Who, who don't they have? I said, well, Freddie Freeman, for one. <laughs> yes, and right. Bryce Harper and Schwarber and, and Raphael Devers and, and any of the other guys. They, they, they seemingly could have made a, a play for, traded for, signed as a free agent, not mm. cut uh, you know, in their own right. And, and that's what this team is missing. It's missing the two best bats that they don't have, which would be the two, bat, the two impact bats, the power bats. Yep. And nothing made it that more obvious to me when I was looking at the uh, on-base plus slugging percentage rankings in MLB. Uh, now, Bellinger and Morrell don't don't qualify because they haven't played enough. But among mm-hmm. Cubs who have played enough, do you know who the, the, the top club is for on-base plus slugging percentages here? Is it Hap? I was going to say, yeah. Oh, I was actually going to say Jan Gomes, but then I was oh. thinking a qualification thing. So it's it's Ian Happ, and Ian Happ has done that, and, and, and even with Jan Gomes, you know, uh, Jan Gomes is is below him. He's seven eighteen now. He's kind of uh, slumped a little. But Ian uh-huh. Happ is. There are twenty nine teams that aren't the Cubs. Ian Happ is the seventy fourth ranked uh, player in all of baseball who qualifies in OPS. That's our best player, number seventy four. Well, seventy four should be your third best player, right? I mean, if you just do the math, sure. 
Yeah. And then after, right after him are Contreras and Rizzo. And then after that, uh, the next three Cubs in order are Swanson at 84, Suzuki at 88, and Horner at 119. And I'm like, yeah, those are fine. Like your fourth, your fifth, and your sixth best hitters, right? Yeah. But what they're missing are the two guys who are like, you know, ranked fourth and 11th, you know, in, in all of baseball. It's it, they're, they're missing the, you know, if you for example, you know, when you look at the, um, the Dodgers, right, they've got Mookie Betts, he's third in all of baseball, Freeman's fourth, and then they've got Will Smith at 11th, and then they've got J.D. Martinez at 16th, and, you know, it goes on and on and on, right? The Braves, same way, they've got, they've got guys all over the place, they got Acuna is second, and Olsen is fifth, and, um, and, and that's what the Cubs are missing, are those top hitters that they just don't have. And when I look at Hap and Swanson and Suzuki and Horner, I, I'm telling people, this is not the core of a winning baseball team. It's just not. These are pieces on a winning baseball team, but this is not a core. This is not what you start with. This is not your, your, inner, your inner four, right? This is your third, fourth, fifth, and sixth players. And, you know, if you want to throw in Morrell somewhere in there, if you could ever find a place to play, you know, in the field, but I mean, I think if we start talking about the Madrigals and the Gomes and the people, then we're just kidding ourselves, right? Because those are just ancillary, right. like <laughs> ancillary yeah. pieces you just pick up here or there. The the Cubs offense is not going to be better, and it's not going to get any better. It's certainly going to get better if and when they trade Bellinger, which I think James is is probably a likely scenario if they don't really kick it into high gear in these next seventeen games because he's a free agent and. And they don't want to sign them long term, so that makes it makes it makes it seems like there's a there's a situation there. But but they desperately need, and it's hard to do, which is why we were Jeremy, as you may recall, so adamant that the Cubs sign top players when top players were available to be had, and they did not because heaven forbid you sign Freddie Freeman and block Matt Mervis from his his you know Hall of Fame career, or you <laughs> sign. You know, two years ago, it was like, you can't sign Francisco Lador, you can't sign Trey Turner, Trey this person, that person, because, you know, Christian Hernandez is going to be, once he once he gets out of rookie ball, I mean, that guy's going to be your starting shortstop. And, and, and so we find ourselves in this weird spot where the Cubs just don't have enough at the very high end. They seem unwilling or or there's a trepidation over going to get that, right? Even Swanson was kind of the bargain guy, right? But but going and getting the Freddie Freeman, they just don't seem necessarily, unless, until until proven otherwise, how about that? They right. don't have what it takes to go out and get those guys. And while their farm system um, reportedly seem, keeps getting better and better, we don't see any of that at the major league level, right? It's like they get to triple A and then they sputter out. And, you know, we've got very little to show for that and certainly not at the impact level the guys even at the guys in the system who who are thought highly of are not guys who it's not like the the 2015 2016 era where it's like he might be the best hitter in all of baseball when he comes up it's not those guys right it's just guys who who might contribute to a major league team and the problem the yeah. cubs have is they need they need the top guys like i spent my whole childhood watching the cubs with with guys like dawson and sandberg and grace like top end players their problem was the rest of the team was awful. Right? Mm -hmm. Now we're in this reverse problem. And having done both scenarios, I can tell you, I'd rather have the three stars and the shitty team oh, than have good. it the other way around. Because <laughs> it's no fun when you don't have the stars to root for. Yeah, and especially when you let you know guys like Kyle Schwarber walk out the door for nothing, and then you literally don't have one of the most electric power hitters in baseball. I mean, heck, Nick Castellanos is still you know hitting the ball pretty well in Philadelphia. Sure. I will I will say that you know I I'm not mad that like the Cubs didn't go out and get like a Devers. Like I'm not ever sure that was like a realistic possibility for them. But I, I agree with your general point about just like the mindset that's been involved in free agency. I mean, for God's sake, guys, like I remember very vividly Bryce Harper all but threw himself at the Cubs when he was going into free agency yes. and the Cubs were just kind of yeah. like, meh, it's like, if a generational talent who's 26 years old wants to join your team, you find a way to make it happen. You don't say, oh, well, we've got all this money tied up yeah. in Jason Hayward. Guess we can't do anything. No. Like, that's Cubs just, ownership. That's a, 
Cubs ownership yes. decided they weren't going to get, they weren't going to make an effort for Bryce Harper because they didn't Idiotic. want to spend the money. They, didn't want to they spend cut the money. Kyle Schwarber. Correct. They cut Kyle Schwarber to save yep. two million dollars to get Jack Peterson, and then they flipped him after about two months with the team in order to get um, Bryce Ball, right? Or, who they just cut? Who they just cut? They just cut. So it, this is not uh, a, a winning strategy, I think, especially for a big market team. We've had that conversation plenty of times, sure. but. You know, Juan Soto was available last year. There are superstars out there who are available. Uh, Juan Soto might be available again at some point with the way San Diego's been trending. Yeah. And, and Otani, and not not through his fault either, right? Uh, no, no, definitely o- not. Then you've got Otani and other guys. But, you know, Otani came out today and said he wants to play for a winner because losing's not fun. Well, this reminds me of the 2014 Cubs when they were trying to get uh, Tanaka, Tanaka, right? And he's like, yeah. I don't want to go there. They suck, right? I mean – it's rare that you get the John Lester's of the world to say, okay, I'll do it. You know, and you have to pay him a lot of money too. You have to pay mm-hmm. him more than anybody else will pay him. And the Cubs at this point under the Jed Hoyer regime, I feel like they've never paid anyone more than anyone else would. It's like they go for the guys who fall in the bargain, right? The bargain basement guys who, it's, whose market drops out. It's the only uh, reason and, they signed you Darvish. The only reason yeah. they signed Darvish. It's the only reason they signed Swanson and, you know, it's. Uh, I think they need to be a little bit more aggressive because where they're at right now is that they've got a bunch of complementary pieces to a team that has no championship anchors. But and... I come, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to a point that I had made earlier, which is out of the uh, available options, like this the trade deadline. There's really not anybody available that I think would move the needle for the Cubs in any appreciable way. When you look at free agency, what do four of probably the top five or six free agents have in common? They're all starting pitchers. Like, there just is not a ton of available talent in terms of offensive players, at least at that high end level. Like, yeah, you've got Shohei Otani, of course. You can argue that Young Hu Lee from, you know, that that could be a potential option just because he could be a good offensive player. But probably the best offensive player who's not named Shohei Otani right now, probably Matt Chapman. And, and that feel, it does fill a need for you, and he's still young enough, and he's having a career year that, you know, you can make an argument that it'd be good to have a guy like that in a corner infield spot. But I, I agree with you, Pat, that I feel like they're probably like two pieces away from that perspective. And so it's like, who are you going to double up on then? Are you going to wait and see if the Mets let Pete Alonso walk out the door? Is that what your strategy is going to be for attracting another piece of top-end talent? Are you going to shock everybody and actually be involved in the sweepstakes for a Shohei Otani. I sort of doubt it, but if you're not in, if you're not in the market for those guys, who do you have left? You have what, like Reese Hoskins, like that Ahmed Rosario. Like that's not the type of pool. That's the type of pool they've been playing in. They need to go get a higher end guy. And basically at this point, it's like Shohei and everybody else essentially in that regard. <laughs> And like I said, sure. Matt Chapman would still be a really strong player and probably the best hitter on the Cubs if they were to go get him. But it still doesn't move the needle in the way that I think that you're talking about. If you had a choice, would you have rather taken Trey Mancini before the season or Jorge Soler? I, I would have. <laughs> ro- I would have rolled the dice on Soler eleven <laughs> times out of ten. Yeah. Like who, who, you know, who's currently twelfth in all baseball at OPS, by the way. Which yeah, is and twenty three and, 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 and I will fully concede it would have been. It wouldn't have been like, oh, I guarantee that dude's going to hit the crap out of the ball and be almost a top ten hitter. But it's like I know what his ceiling is, and I know how hard that dude can hit the baseball. And guess what the Cubs don't do? And by the way, I'm going to point this out. Why is every single photo of Trey Mancini fielding a ball at first base look like he's grimacing, like he's scared of the ball, like he's trying to fend off like a swarm of bees? What is this? I don't get it. And and we saw what Trey Mancini was trending towards uh, last year. I mean, you saw. Yeah, this a, is not a surprise to anybody. Not at all. Uh, but, well, uh, I mean, but that's the strategy. If you don't go after the top level players and you're going to do a lot of bargain basement, you know, hunting, you're going to hit on some guys and you're going to lose on. So you're going to get a Jan Gomes, who's turned out to be serviceable. You're going to get a Bellinger. Mancini, who's been bad. Bellinger, who's not been bad at all. You know, uh, you're going to get 
uh, a Barnhart who is not so great, or Eric, Eric Hosmer who was cut Ugh. last year. It was the VRs and the Simmonses. I mean, you're going to get the Fulmers. You're going to get you're just you're Kaon. You're going to get a wide spectrum of guys, uh, so, many of whom a uh, Boxberger. You know, many of whom just miss. David Robertson, you know, hits. You know, I mean, you're going to get a couple of those, but, sure. but the guys who do hit are just better than you expected. They don't hit like they're not like. Uh, you know, top ten, top twenty, top thirty players in baseball, right? They they just they're just better than what you expected for the money you spent, and they're always on a one year deal, and you always turn around and you and you trade them at the deadline, and you get something for them. You hope, um, you know, you trade a, a Scott Efros, and you get Hayden Wisniewski, and you hope that works out, and and whatever. But but it does feel like you're kind of you're kind of in that same. Uh, what do they call that in, in the fish world, like chum, or you know, it's it's a it's that bottom twelve to thirteen guys on your roster, the bottom half of your roster, right? That's the thing that you keep turning over every year and trying to find a, a diamond in the rough, so that you then turn around and trade that diamond at the All Star break and 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 start all over again the following year, you know, and and so something's got to give. Especially, so there's two, there's two ways to do it. Um, we talked about the free agent route, and the class isn't that exciting next year uh the trade deadline route at this which we knew last year when we were begging them to sure be more did. aggressive yep yep and so, so if you're not going to do that and you've built up your farm system to where you're very happy with your farm system you've you've got two things you can wait for the farm system to make it to the major leagues and hope that you hit on a certain percentage of these prospects or you can take those prospects and package them and ship them out and bring it to get a high end talent. You can you can make trades. This team is eligible to trade with other teams to acquire <laughs> players. Uh, that is just something we haven't seen uh, in in a long time since they were in the championship years of adding pieces. Uh, but what they're not doing is going out and 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 getting a a a key piece. That's how you get. Uh, that's how you get some of these franchise players who would never hit free agency, but uh, you can go out and, and make those deals. And I just don't know if this regime has it in it to, to not fall in love with their prospects and just try to wash, rinse, repeat on what happened with 2015 and 2016. It's just so yeah, disappointing uh, talking about this in this way. Although I, I would also ask you then like who, who's potentially available to make one of those types of trades. Like, I feel like if you were going to do that last year, could have been an opportunity if the nationals were serious about shopping Juan Soto. Like I know the Cubs didn't have probably a Mackenzie Gore that they were able to give up for that, but you could still make a pretty appealing player package with some of the guys they do have kicking, kicking around in like the double and triple A levels, of their farm system right now. And I'm not even talking like, you know, use PCA to go get somebody. Like, I think that everyone kind of universally agrees that dude probably will be the best defensive center fielder in baseball, could have, you know, elite level, you know, hit tool, whatever. But there are definitely other guys in your system you could package to go get a real damn good player if you want to. And then the key factor, make sure you then turn around and pay said player to keep them around to justify your investment. Like, that's immediately the thought I had if the Mets are at all thinking about getting rid of Pete Alonso, because they have so much money on their books already, and it's obviously not really paying a ton of dividends for them right now. Why not kick the tires on a Pete Alonso? See if you can get him locked up to an extension and use your prospect assets to make something like that happen. That's the type of move that you need to do to actually build the star power and the the cachet of this team. The starting catcher in the all-star game for the national league it's a guy named sean murphy who the cubs easily could have gotten through a package of players right I, i'm not so sure i'm not so sure about that the the oakland days just seem to love taking subpar packages from <laughs> like the Atlanta Brave. i'm you not think i think the cubs, cubs could may have had to overpay package i don't know <laughs> uh, the but cubs that, are their team like uh who the cubs can yeah. do better than that <laughs> and then remember William Contreras went to Milwaukee and it's like wait why is he not going to Oakland <laughs> how does Milwaukee get the second best player in this trade what the hell just happened <laughs> I know it, it's 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 very frustrating but you know you got to be in those talks in order to 
occasionally get, you know, uh, a deal like that. And, oh, you're getting into dangerous White Sox type territory there where, oh, we were somewhat involved. <laughs> oh, we were, we were, yes. <laughs> I, I was we finished say actually in involved. Seconds. I was going to say actually involved, but um, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it is depressing when you look and you're like, oh, the All Star team has as many, the National League All Star roster has as many ex Cubs as it has actual Cubs. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. And then you look at some of the guys who you uh, talk about who, who you know, uh, the Cubs would like to acquire, and it's like, didn't we have that guy once? Yeah, the Cubs seem to make a lot of trades with the Tigers for players like uh, uh, Candelero and, and Paradis and all these guys who, who then, in retrospect, are like, wow, I, I guess we didn't know how good they would be because we just traded him for Justin Wilson or whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, those are rough, but no, I, I think that the Cubs right now are, are sort of at a crossroads where they have to decide, uh, what they I think they have to be more bold because I don't think this idea of just waiting for a wave of prospects to come to the major leagues and bail everybody out, it's not gonna happen. Right? Like they don't have that. I don't know players. I don't know if it's my Blackhawks PTSD where like they uh, they fell in love with a way to build a team and they were just going to do that every single time. And I, I and maybe the Cubs aren't that. Um, what do you mean? Wait for Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane to fall into your lap in back-to-back drafts? And Is that's, that the way you're talking about? <laughs> the, and and do your high draft pick get uh, the, the – with the Cubs uh, having a – in 2015 we were successful by having uh, – a wave of prospects come up and be great. And so we're going to do it again. And that'll be how we're great again is when we have the next wave of prospects come up. And I don't, uh, I, I, I don't think that that's the, the way that this team can do it uh, based on their lack of the same amount of good prospects that they had at that time. And the way that prospects aren't panning out. Prospects keep getting hurt. Prospects yeah. keep not making it. Um, We're getting to triple A and falling on their face. Right. Yeah, and, and, and you combine that with the fact that, let's not forget, when it comes to this the first time, they were the original tankers, right? They were tanking and getting the second pick in the draft, the fifth pick in the draft, the sixth pick in the draft, the seventh pick in the draft. And then the Astros, of course, also realized, hey, wait, we can do that too. So they were sort of doing it simultaneously with the Cubs. But right now, you've got a dozen teams at any one time that feel like they're tanking like so it's a lot harder to get those you have a dozen teams that just aren't tr- aren't trying to yeah they're, I mean, they're not even one, trying to tank they're just just barely showing they're up. not trying period yeah, yeah. Period. if Cubs want a top five draft pick they're gonna have to lose 100 games like or more like maybe if you want a top draft pick you might have to lose 125 games if you're not gonna there. happen the this rate oakland and kansas city are going so even, don't even forget, a it's a lottery it's, now. It's not just the record. So, but even with the lottery, it's 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 hard for for a team like the Cubs, who you know at their worst probably are going to slide in at like the eleventh or tenth pick in the draft. That's like uh, in the NBA, they call that NBA hell, right? Where you're you're not bad enough to get the superstars, but you're not good enough to to be a good team and go to playoffs, and and that's. Uh, where the Cubs have been falling lately. And it doesn't help when you win 10 out of 11 in September or whatever they did last year. I thought about that yesterday during that major baseball draft. I'm like, it would be nice if we were drafting a couple spots higher right now. Yeah. But, but no, no knock on Matt Shaw, who had a great season at Maryland. Yeah. But, yeah, but you, yeah. you you know, it's it's extra frustrating because we talked about you, – you listed off a bunch of players, Pat, from the Dodgers and, and the Braves. Neither team – has gone through a rebuild recently uh, and they have all these players because they're, they're consistently good and they are able to get good prospects and free agents and make good trades. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they do all of those. The Dodgers do all of those things and they're likely to get Otani. And it's like, give me a break. Like they, Mookie Betts is not their player. Freddie Freeman, not their player. Uh, but then they have guys who were their players like, the, the Cody Bellingers and other folks that come up through their system. And, and, and you have just a, a, a team that's the, that doesn't, the, they're going to go for it every year. And, and the Cubs we're, we're right now talking about them having to stand pat or sell off a couple pieces, but not buy anything in a, in a year where the division could be won with, 
barely 80 games. Uh, that's... I mean, when the Cubs were winning the World Series in 2016, you know, halfway through that season when we were we were uh, happy as, as can be, the Dodgers were taking Will Smith with the last pick in the first round of the draft, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, 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 you know, he's an all-star. Like, it's that it's that kind of thing that, that um, other teams have been able to do that we have not. And I guess my question for you, James, uh, at, at what point, if we give the team the benefit of the doubt that they, that they are, you know, they've done this kind of quasi rebuild, at what point do we have to start seeing players come up and being impact players? Like the, the sell off was in the middle of 2021. So we're now two years away from that, two and a half years from the Darvish trade, if you want to look yeah. at it that way. At what point does a Ben Brown or a Wisniewski or, you know, a Wix or at what point do these guys have to actually start being like legit, you know, two, number two, number three, or number four pitchers. At what point do we actually have to have some of these young bats come up and actually be impact players? Because it feels like it's taking forever. And whenever somebody seems to get close, then they get bad. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, we saw what happened with Matt Mervis. We saw, you know, Hayden Wisniewski has been very up and down. Like I think that's, yeah, yeah, Caleb God, Caleb Gillian. There was so Brandon much Davis. hype around him. <laughs> you know, I, uh... I, I, I've always been kind of of the mindset that I kind of assumed like Pete Crow Armstrong would kind of be like the the straw that broke the camel's back with that. Like I think he'll probably it would be him coming up next year because I think you're also going to see at that rate like a Kevin Alcantara, Ben Brown will probably be up next season. So I always had kind of like circled that one, just kind of in like my Brown mind. Going to be up in a month until that's until what I right. I, I mean, still <laughs> theoretically could see him up this year, I suppose. But I kind of had penciled him in for the same thing, and then. As for guys like, you know, Brennan Davis, like Jordan Wicks or uh, Alexander Canario, like I thought those dudes would already be here. And of course, injuries have kind of messed with that timeline a little bit. But I at least thought that like maybe the first wave of those guys like or Owen Cassie, like I thought maybe he would be up as well like that maybe this year. But then next year was going to be like the big one with like Brown and Crow Armstrong and uh, those guys. So honestly, to me. If PCA is not competing, realistically competing for a roster spot in spring training next year or is already penciled in to be in the Cubs lineup in 2024, like I feel like that is a massive red flag that there's something going on with just kind of their development arc and the way that they're treating everything. And maybe they're being a little bit too slow and a little bit gun shy because they've seen what ha- what has happened with guys like your Matt Mervis is and been like, Oh, we don't want to rush these guys along. Yeah. But you also need to get them to the show at some point, right? Like that's ultimately what it boils down to, to me. Like I I think after the trade deadline, there is literally no reason whatsoever. Matt Mervis shouldn't be up here getting at bats. You're telling me that you'd rather have Trey Mancini taking at bats at first base. You're telling me that you'd rather have Jared young flailing about the way that he has at time. No, I want to see Matt Mervis up here to prove to me whether or not you can flip and do it. I think he had some bad luck, but yeah, that's the type of guy that needs to be here. He needs to be in Chicago making his mistakes here. Yeah. Five, six games a week for a couple months and see if he can hack it. Cause they're going to need to know the answer to that question before next year. Yep. And, you know, and again, it'll inform what they do in free agency or in the trade market. Like if you need to really like step up your or hell, it might inform what they do with Cody Bellinger, too. If they're like really convinced that Matt Mervis may not pan out whatsoever. Why, why shouldn't you like pursue potentially picking up that mutual option with Bellinger or signing him to a new deal? Because having his bat in the lineup is pretty damn valuable, even if it's at first base. Uh, speaking of uh, Pete Crow Armstrong, you know, I have this fear in the back of my mind that Armstrong is going to be this electric, fast guy who plays very good defense and hits 240 and Ugh. doesn't do anything to really move the lineup forward and actually is like kind of your seventh place hitter or your eighth place hitter. Albert but plays Warren, off speed. a building. Somebody, somebody, who has, somebody who has decent war, right? Decent enough, kind of like Horner. Like, you look at Horner, and you're like, oh, the guy steals bases. He plays great defense. But you look at his offensive line, his actual numbers, and his OPS is 697. Like, you know, he's he's a below-average OPS-plus hitter. He's a 90. 
He's not even 100 being average. That's what I'm afraid Pete Crow Armstrong is going to be. He's going to be a below average hitter. Nico Horner right now is a below average hitter. So, well, what would you consider to be an acceptable level for PCA? Like, I feel like if he can, I feel like he has the capability of hitting 20 home runs and stealing 30 bases. And I think that your lineup would be thrilled to have a guy who can hit those benchmarks consistently sure. every season. Like, I think that I think the stolen base element with him is so critical. Like, I know that Nico Horner's had a really good year of stealing bases, but I feel He's like a having April. a guy who He's can have. That's yeah, good. that's fair. Fair point. Um, but if he, yeah, if he can steal, you know, 30 bags and hit 20 home runs and play the defense that we're, that he's capable of playing, that That'll puts him ahead of a lot yeah. of center fielders in this league. Sure. The, 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 and this isn't really fair to him. This is just sort of the reality of the team, which is they need yeah. impact bats. Oh, they need and, him to hit so, so badly. They need him to not, hit. If he's not really going to hit, uh, if he's going to be a, a below average hitter, Regardless of his speed and regardless of his defense, if his bat, his actual bat is below average or even just average. Right. I was going to um, say. Not, he, that doesn't move the needle of uh-uh. this team. Uh, Seiya Suzuki is a huge, a huge, at this point, disappointment so far, I, I'd have to say, based on what they were hoping for. Yeah. And Ian Happ is Ian Happ. And, you know, as we've seen with Dansby Swanson, like, yeah, he's he's good offensive player, but but like he was the Braves, he's never he's not your he's not your guy. He's not the he's not the middle of the order guy, and that's part you, of the problem yeah. with this team is they bat all mm-hmm. these guys third, second, third, and fourth, and they really should be batting them fifth, sixth, and seventh. I was gonna say, on what planet should Seiya Suzuki be batting fourth for a team? The answer is not one I want to be a part of. No, like that he, just, like, like like we talked about with the OPSs earlier, Hap and Swanson, Suzuki and Horner especially the latter three, those guys are because you don't have your best two hitters on the team because you never bothered to get them in the first place. <laughs> those guys are forced to, to, to play out of, out of, I say out of position, but you know, batting out of, out of role. How about that? Mm. They're forced to be out of role because yeah. there is no, there is no choice. Um, because there's nobody away, else. You can get away with Swanson being your second best hitter. It's not ideal, but especially in a division like this, I think you could get away with it. Ideally, like you said, like third best is like, that's his sweet spot. And if he hits 25 homers and drives in 90 RBIs, that is perfect. Like that is a great guy to have as your third spot. And that makes you a legit contender in the National League. But Cubs are a little ways away from that, I fear. So looking ahead then to – as we we we're at the All Star break now, uh, the Cubs have a home stand coming up against Boston, against the Washington Nationals, and mm. then four at home against the the terrible St. Louis Cardinals. Boy, are uh, they bad! I went to the game Sunday at uh, the Cardinals and White Sox game, and uh, wow, I the Cardinals had three errors, and I was I was telling I was telling my father in law that. Uh, I can't remember the last time I saw a Cardinals team this bad making this many mistakes. Like they are, that team is bad. And and then their bullpen uh, is is also not great. Their managers pulling out mats after uh, seventy pitches, and he's cruising <laughs> along. I'm like, what is going on with this Cardinals team? And uh, yeah, it's so. The good news for the Cubs is, uh, yeah, this division wide open could be wide open for another couple of years. Here is, uh, you know, with uh, uh, with where where the Cardinals are now and where the Brewers always are, and Cincinnati. Uh, I don't know if this is the start of a Cincinnati Renaissance or it's just a hot time for the Reds, but uh, no, this is the division's wide open. They've got a chance to go for it, and the format now is a uh, you know make the playoffs and see if you can get hot in October. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. what that's baseball. Uh, so if you can do it, you've got a path, you've got to take your shots at it. And so, uh, we'll know, we'll know, I think after this, what would you call this? A 14 game homestand. This is a big to home stand. So, I was going to say, they basically don't leave the state of Illinois. They leave once the rest of July. I think they go down to St. Uh, Louis to and St. that's Louis like on it. The 27th. Right. So, and their other road games are at the white Sox. So if they, if they, rip off some some wins here uh do you see james the cubs 
just kind of standing pat uh, or picking around the edges, maybe a, a bullpen guy here or there, but not giving up much. Just uh, uh, Or do you see them actually trying to give it a go somehow? Um, I think the one thing you don't see them doing is just going for a rental that will only help them this season. I think the only trade they would potentially make would be a guy that it would be guaranteed to be in their lineup next season. And I think that would be a really smart move for them. Jump the market a little bit, do whatever you have to do. I would say that there are two priorities to me. And one of them is that, that if you're going to make a trade, make sure that it's also for 2024, not just for this season. I'm not interested in any pending UFAs. That is not the market the Cubs need to be involved in. Unless you're literally going to turn around and sign that guy to an extension, which I highly doubt any of them will agree to. Because once you're this close to free agency, it makes very little sense to say, nah, I'm not going to hit market at this point. Like April, yes, totally makes sense. Now, not so much. So that's priority number one is only go for guys. Who are I think they should be scouring next year. What? Who should they be scouring for, Pat? I, I think they should be reaching out, like you said, James, to teams like the Mets, yep. Washington, yep. the Royals, the A's, anybody, the Rockies, anybody who's bad, the Padres, anybody who looks like they're going to punt and try to save some money and and vol- try to vulture some people. Frankly, yeah, some people yeah. who have more years on their deals with a long-term plan in order because, you know, for the Cubs sake, like these next 16 games, which amounts to like 22% of the the remainder games of the season. So it's a, it's a big chunk. It's like a fifth of yeah. the, over a fifth, almost a quarter of the rest of the season are all at home or in Chicago. And if they, even if they don't make significant progress, even if they're like, you know, 10 and six, nine and seven, seven and nine, whatever, whatever it might be, that doesn't preclude them from trying to, take advantage of one of these teams who intentionally wants to tank and wants to save money. I mean, we're a big market team. It's such an advantage actually to be able to go out there and, and weaponize and really, your money. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And there are some teams out there like the Mets that really overextended on contracts and probably have bloated, you know, several bloated contracts and, and may want to actually go out and spend some money in the off seasons. So they've got, a, they've got some contracts they need to unload and you might be able to get somebody when they're a little bit vulnerable and, same thing with the Padres. They're in the same shape. And then you've got hapless teams like the Rockies and Kansas City and Oakland. I mean, they're, you know, like just ask them, like just pick whatever players on their team. You're like, oh, that guy might be worth something and see what they say, frankly, at this point. Uh, but yeah. I, would like I was going to say, who's their, who's their best player even right now? Is it like CJ, like what? Ryan McMahon, CJ Ryan Crone? CJ Crone, yeah. The- hey. Yeah. I would take Ryan McMahon in all in all seriousness. Oh, sure. Uh, I, a third baseman. Third base, yeah, done. He's 28 years old. He's a third baseman. You know, he's, you yeah. know, he, he, he's, he would be an upgrade over what the Cubs have. When you've got holes at first, third, and depending on what happens to Morrell, possibly DH, you've got plenty of room to play around, especially when you don't have any Freddie Freemans in the offseason as free mm-hmm. agents. You, you need to, to, to strike while you can. And I know. Ryan McMahon is the sexy pick because, uh, you know, but he's, hey, he'd, he'd be number one in the Cubs and on base percentage. I'll tell you that. I mean, he, you know, he, he has a lot going for him. He can, he's not, I wouldn't call him a, a power hitter per se, but mm. he's, he's got more power than most people on this team. I mean, he's going to hit 20 some homers. Sure. And, um, and I, I know his defense uh, is pretty good. Uh, at third base, in fact, it's very good. I think so. Yeah. Well, and perfect. the Rockies are incompetent. They, you might trick them into thinking that they already traded him to you. They, they, they did. <laughs> they did. You know, pay the Cardinals to take Nolan Arenado yes. off the yeah. hand. So <laughs> exactly. I'm not saying, of course, Ryan McMahon is anywhere near the player that he is. But but think about McMahon. He's got four years left on his contract after this year, right? Uh huh. And they have, and they're going to pay him uh, fifty six million dollars in those four years. Now. This is a team that went out and also got uh, Chris Bryant uh, really? a couple years or last offseason, and and that's gone nowhere. So so, does it really make sense to keep a guy with who they owe fifty six million dollars to for the next four years? I mean, look, you're right. Like they did with Arenado, why not try to take this guy away and give them a chance to to kind of reset and and give them a couple of our prized prospects who we've never seen play above South Bend and. Yeah. <laughs> take a, and take a chance because that's the kind of guy 
who um, would sort of be at the top end of those those pieces I was talking about earlier, the Haps and the and the others and the Suzukis and the Swansons. But at some point, you know, if you can't get two impact bats, get one impact bat and have like seven other guys who are like actually, you know, yeah. sort of decent guys as opposed to as opposed to bad guys like like the Hosmers and the Mancinis, et cetera. So. Mm. And, I, I, and I don't want to watch Nick Matter go and Patrick Wisdom at first base or third base hell anymore. No, I, I don't. No. I want a guy with a good glove who can hit for a little power, <laughs> yeah. get on base. I mean, what the hell? Why not? And that's so why that's I think that you make sure that you get a guy like a, like you said that is going to be there. Brian McMahon's a great example of that that's going to be here for several years. If you're really serious about adding PCA and guys like that and really taking a jump forward in 2024, that gets you a hell of a lot closer to that goal than going out and trying to get like a Josh Hader for a few months or something like that. I think that needs to be focus number one, and I think they can do that whether or not they think they're going to compete the rest of this season. As you said, they cannot possibly tank hard enough to actually no. make a you know, appreciable impact on their draft positioning for next season. That's just not going to happen. Nor should but they. They are done it, with Exactly. That. Yeah. Exactly. I think the other thing that they need to make sure that they do, you cannot lose Marcus Stroman for nothing. If you are legitimately not going to try to re-sign that guy, I don't care whether you think you're going to contend this season or not. I think you have to trade him. I just don't. I know the market is kind of going to be saturated with some starting pitching. I think that, you know, you look at guys like Lucas Giolito potentially going to be available, Jordan Montgomery, like players like that. Max Scherzer might even be available. Like I get that the market is not going to like give you a massive return for Marcus Stroman. You can't give him a qualifying offer. This isn't going to be a situation where you at least get a draft pick like you did with Wilson Contreras. You will get nothing if you let him walk for nothing. And I think that the Cubs really just shouldn't run that chance. And I think that, you know, just having him around, you know, I don't want to just have him on the roster, you know, with that like opt out question floating over his head. I don't think that does anybody any, any good. So I say either re-sign him or trade him. I think that doing nothing is a really – that would be a bad path forward for the Cubs as far as I'm concerned. I think the first thing they could do is pick up the phone and call his agent and say, hey, you want to talk? Because that's something they, they haven't been interested in doing to date. Yeah, Wouldn't it have... be nice to know? What do you I don't understand that mentality either. Like Marcus yeah, Stroman has well, very publicly said – he wants to be here, and if you want to like sign him to a four-year deal, that fits your contention window, and I can probably assure you he'll be good for at least two of those seasons. And you don't, It's not like you've got a ton of like number two starters banging down the door to get here from the minors. Like, I, I would this... love to tell, to tell Marcus Sturman, hey, dude, we're trying to swing a trade for Ryan McMahon so we can have a third baseman who's good defensively behind you. We just want to make sure you're still going to be here. So – so we don't if we trade some of our pitching prospects, we don't get hung out to dry. So what's it gonna yeah. take for you to sign here and let's try to get something done in the next you know, couple of weeks? I would like to take that strategy because without, as you point out, without Stroman next year, the Cubs starting rotation all of a sudden, for as much as we say starting you know, pitching isn't a problem, it becomes Justin Steele, Jameson Teon, and Drew Smiley. <laughs> and no, I say no Kyle Hendricks. I mean that's no, I mean, it, he's a free agent. And... Tough waters there. And I know there are some free agents, like I mentioned Montgomery earlier, and Giolito is going to, in all likelihood, be a free agent. Like, those guys will be, you know, solid. But I also think why cause yourself to have to go back into that market when you have other needs, too? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't make sense to and, me. And it's not like like there's big questions about Strowman. Like, he's he's exactly he's exceeding the expectations of what you thought he'd be with this contract yeah. already he's he's in a the young screen would say he is he's what an he all-star is, jeremy yeah yeah he is what he is yeah so, yep. so i so yeah there's nothing more he can do this season to convince you that re-signing him would be a good idea like so it's yeah it's literally up to the cubs and uh, we know stroman's a listener of this podcast because uh, he yeah. he started being very vocal about it when we were asking questions about it so uh <laughs> obviously he listens so uh so hopefully if, if he's listening uh we hope we're still pulling th for the cubs to pick up the phone and uh uh, make an offer and re-sign. Re-signing Marcus Stroman would go a long way with what the rest of this season could help us get through uh, the rest of what could be a tough stretch down this down the rest of the season here. Give us something to be happy about. 
Um, man, uh, <laughs> I, I think, uh, I, I mean, watching the continued development of some of the guys like that have like Justin Steele, I'm really pumped to watch him the rest of the Absolutely. season. I think that his arc's been really fun. I've really enjoyed watching him play. I, I've loved the emergence of Edward Alzali, like late inning guy in the bullpen. I think that like the the swing from starting pitching to mid relief to like potential closer material, that has been an absolute blast as well. And like I had mentioned earlier, I still feel like we could potentially get a hot streak at some point from any and hat, make you feel a little bit better about the extension that you gave him. And during this season, like it's he's so a streaky guy. He'll, he'll, exceedingly he'll streak, exactly. Guys. Like yeah. I, I feel like he's due like that's that to me, I think Alzali and I think he's like one of the guys that I definitely am like, you know, I want to see this. I want to see him continue to play in hell. I just want to see Christopher Morrell continue to swing the bat. Is that too much to ask? So like, much fun. That Christopher... dude's entertaining as all get out. Christopher yeah. Morrell's so much fun, and I love that you brought up Alzale because just even last week, watching him pick up these saves, you're watching a guy build confidence and becoming mm-hmm. starting to starting to really steer into the closer role and enjoy mm-hmm. like he likes the successes of uh closing out a game though. sure as hell does <laughs> that's that's a great sign you gotta have that certain mentality to be a closer mm-hmm. uh, he's given all the signs that he he could have really and, and the stuff kind of like kind of like what we thought braylon marquez would end up potentially being and that's what al zali is uh he, he's like derailed uh marquez and taken yes. over that track yeah <laughs> God, poor marquez Mm-hmm. <sighs> or poor us, I guess. <laughs> One so, of the, yeah. So Shame on him. Poor us. <laughs> so we, we won't be here next week. We're gonna take, like I mentioned, we're gonna take the week Hopefully. off. So we'll do. Uh, so the next time we come back, this crucial homestand will be over. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna ask for predictions for the upcoming homestand, not knowing Old any of the pitching games matches. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Man. That's uh, educated, yeah. educated predictions here, huh? Oh yeah, games. this will certainly go well. I'm sure we can only take a take a stab at it, uh, right? But people, people demand it. When we don't do it, it shows up on Twitter. <laughs> people ask, "Where's our prediction?" Because we're so we've gotten pretty good at it. But this is going to be a shot in the dark. We don't know. I, I think the last few times I've actually made predictions, I've actually like come relatively close or actually hit the numbers. So I've got a little bit of pressure on me. Yeah. <laughs> um. I'm going to say that the Cubs will go, I think, six and four is what they'll end up doing on the homestand. I know that's not the most optimistic thing in the world, but I feel like they lose. I think they can win three out of four against St. Louis and yep. two out of three at least against Washington. That Boston series, I keep tripping up on because they're either going to come out like a rocket or they're going to come out with a whimper from the time off. So I'm going to go six and four saying they lose the Boston series, but rebound with win winning series over the Nats and the Cardinals. Pat? I'm with James on this one. I'm going to say six and four. If for no other reason that I'm a homer and anything <laughs> short of six and four, I think is pretty much, you know, lights out. Yep. Uh, curtain call. Because you can't, they've got 73 games left in the year. You can't, you know, can't just dance away 10 of them and get down to 63 without moving anywhere. So yeah, Mm -hmm. six and four. Okay. Yeah. After seeing the Cardinals live and in person, I, there's no way they can't take three or four from there. And uh, yeah, I, I I think six and four is incredibly doable. So I think we'll make it unanimous six and four. You heard it here first. Uh, unanimous selection from the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. So by the time we come back, <laughs> we'll be uh, previewing the White Sox series and at St. Louis before they mm-hmm. go on to play the Reds and take to, to turn the calendar to August already. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, yep. if we're not at least six and four in those ten games, then we're we'll be doing a lot of trade deadline talk, unfortunately. So yeah. Yep, that's been uh, that, that's been the story of this podcast for quite a few years now. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, we are going to call it a podcast. We're we're up against time, so please, James, remind all of our listeners where they can continue to hear your fantastic analysis and uh, and, and your voice as well. 
I do co-host the Cubs Talk podcast for NBC Sports Chicago with Layla Rahimi and Nate Poppin. We will be recording a new episode on Wednesday to kind of preview the second half of the season. So tune in for that. I also do do Blackhawks talk. Been doing Blackhawks podcasts for a good long time. Jeremy and Pat both know this. Um, With Pat Boyle and Charlie Romeliotis. And then actually new these last few weeks, I've been hosting a podcast called Big Ten Country, getting ready for the upcoming football season, been covering the Northwestern uh, scandal pretty say, extensively any, any on that there show. Going on in the Big Ten? <laughs> yeah, just, you know, a few things. <laughs> um, ironically, Pat Fitzgerald, basically the only coach that we hadn't gotten a chance to talk to about the program. So, whoops, we've had interviews with Brett Bielema from Illinois. Uh, we've had Luke Fickle from Wisconsin, Kirk Ferentz from Iowa. We're going to be interviewing uh, Greg Schiano and Tom Allen this week. So lots of good stuff coming up on that. So if you're a fan of college football, be sure to check out Big Ten Country. Shameless plug time. Got it. And you can uh, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and threads at Wrigleyville Nat for all of those locations. Uh Facebook.com slash Wrigleyville Nation as well. And you can also support our show via Patreon, patreon.com slash Wrigleyville Nation. That is where you can support the podcast, keeping us ad free for our fifth season in a row here. So uh, thank you to all of our patrons who continue to support the show. If you can't support the show financially, that's okay as well. You can always. Tell your Cub fan friends about the show. Show them how to subscribe to the podcast. And uh, we rely on your word of mouth to uh, continue to spread the word. Uh, As the the trade deadline is approaching, Show people are asking about Cubs content. Tell them this is where you get it. Show them how to sign up for the podcast and uh, uh, continue to support us that way. So we appreciate all of our listeners, everyone uh, who continues to support the show. We couldn't do it without you. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. Pat, thank you for joining us. Have a great all-star break, Jeremy. Enjoy your break as well. Thanks again, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.